I just had one of those days, and I hope you have them too because they're quite rewarding, where you had so much to do, you just couldn't get it all done. And I say it's rewarding because when you work hard and you do get a lot done, but still there's more to do, it's because you're making progress. And I hope you find those days encouraging and not stressful and not overwhelming because you know what? Most things can wait another day. Most things do not need to be done in the same day. And you shouldn't be feeling the stress about that. So hope that it finds encouragement for you and you have a proper perspective on that. Welcome to How to Build a Tent. My name is Matt Williams. Thank you for listening to the show, sharing the show, liking, subscribing, sharing with a friend. That is what encourages me. There is no higher compliment. If you like this content, if you like this show, sharing it on your social media, sharing it with a friend in a direct message or liking or commenting and just sharing how you've been blessed from it, uh, that is just the greatest compliment. We're part of the Fight, Laugh, Feast Network. Go over to flfnetwork.com. Put in the HDBT in a memo field. You'll get a sweet 15-ounce mug. I haven't been giving out a lot lately, so um, don't miss out. And you can get tons of other great benefits. we got our conference coming up. In October, you don't want to miss that either. And there's also tons of other great content. There's a lot of great shows out there. We have a baseball show now, and it's absolutely fantastic. So make sure you download the app and check that out. You can email email me, Matt, at howtobuildatent.com and find me on all the social media sites, How to Build a Tent. And let's get into it. Now, one of the reasons why I didn't get as much done as I wanted to today is because, quite frankly, I was exhausted. I didn't sleep last night. My mind was up racing. When I start working on a new project, which I hope to tell you about someday, I have a mind that races. So if I wake up for anything at all, I have to go to the bathroom, hear a noise. In this case, one of my kid's toys fell into my bathtub in my room, and it woke me up, and then my mind started going 100 miles an hour. I don't know if you guys think that way. Your, your mind, as soon as it wakes up early in the morning, two, three in the morning, bam. And I was just in slow motion a lot of the day, but I was getting a lot of stuff done. And I was about to start prepping for the show, and my son just needed attention. He just, not being bad, not being difficult, but just constantly asking for me, constantly wanting to wrestle. You know, he's a younger toddler. Wanted to run around, be chased, be thrown, be all those things that... You should be doing as a father with your son. And I just put it off. You know, you have to make you have to make judgment calls. You have to realize what is important in life. And if you know, if I have a bad podcast or if I didn't get a long enough podcast where I don't get to say enough of what I want to say or don't have a long enough show, like what's the end of the world? I would rather spend the time I have, <laughs> exhausted, whatever, running out of time, getting too much done, where I am, you know, being faithful to what God's called me to being responsible to the priorities I have. And I just want to use that as a reminder for you too, is even if it feels like you haven't got everything you needed to get through today and you're tired, make sure that you are prioritizing what's important in life. Make sure that you are investing in your family, investing in your children, your wife, most of all in the family context and just be there for them. It's again, What's the worst that's going to happen? You have to put off something to the next day. You don't have a good podcast. You don't get the numbers you wanted. Like, who cares? Seriously, like, who cares at all? It doesn't matter. And in the grand scheme of things, is I'd rather be a great father and a terrible podcaster all day long. I saw this article before I came on, and it was in New York. I'm opening my doors. Come hell or high water, New York City clothier, clother defies Cuomo. <laughs> clother defies Cuomo. I love that. I'm fighting for the soul of my company and my people, he said. I'm doing what I think is right to protect my business and employees from this dis- disaster. If I do get in trouble, it'll be for the right reasons. What are they going to do? Yell and scream at me? Find me $500? It would be worth it for me to be able to open my mouth and say this is not equitable. They try to arrest me and say I am in a police state. And I'll say, I'm, am I in a police state now? They're not going to arrest me. Well, they might arrest you. They might arrest you arrest you. And he goes on and says this, I'm opening my doors come hell or high water. Why is a liquor store essential and I am not? And that is the rub, guys. That is the rub. Because if the clothing store isn't essential, but the liquor store is, that means nobody's essential. When the government 
the moment the government starts picking who is essential, who is not, we all become essential, unessential. We all become at the mercy of the crown. If it pleases the crown, can I open my doors and provide for my family? I uh, I don't know what accent that was, by the way. I'm sorry. I'm really tired. It's going to be one of those shows. This morning, I was going to the bank, which, by the way, you are now able to open checking accounts, business checking accounts online. Didn't know that until I went to the store. That was that was wonderful. And I was filming. It's on Instagram, my stories. Actually, I think I put on all the social media sites that, I, that I'm on that uh, the, all the businesses are closed. But certain businesses are open. And who is it to say what is essential and what is not? Because we we get all in a tizzy when the government will pick winners and losers when we do bailouts, when we do special tax breaks, when we do any of those things. But for some reason, no one cares that the government is picking winners and losers in a crisis where it matters the most, where we have so much unemployment. And the weirdest thing is, is the only way they evaluate what is essential is based on the customer. But what about that small business owner who has a business that he relies on to feed for his family, to provide for his kids, to put a roof over their heads to clothe them. Do you think his business is essential to him? And the 20 shops that I was filming in the corner strip mall, which I don't know why they call it a strip mall. It seems trashy. Like There's got to be a better way to say it than strip mall, right? The 20 stores lined up, not making any money, closed. Do you think that the 20 owners or more, because... You know, you can have multiple multiple owners of a, a business. Do you think that that's not essential to them? Who do you think you are, government? Who do you think you are? Well, they think they're God because they think they know everything. They think they know what's best and you have no say. So we're going to tell you what to do and what to think. You know, one of the things that made this country great is in the founding documents was the idea that our rights were not declared, they were not thought up, they were not created by any government. Our rights were not set out, carved out by any group of rulers, but they were Evident from creation, evident from the Bible, that God has given us these rights that are self-evident. And so the government, the constitution, the laws do not determine what our rights are, but they are there to protect our rights. Our government is established to protect the rights that God gave us. Our constitution is there to protect us from the government, from the rights God gave us. And when we allowed the government to declare, to determine, to set out the boundaries for our business, who is essential and who is not, is the moment we forfeited that foundation in our country. What is the difference? What is the difference between saying you have the right to free speech, you have the right to protect yourself? What's the difference between that and the government saying you don't have a right to feed your family? You don't have the right to provide for yourself. What's the difference? They've taken people's livelihoods. They've taken their business. Why will they not take the rest? And the truth is, is this isn't the first overreach. We've been dealing with it for a hundred years. For a hundred years. And so when they come after our businesses, it shouldn't be a surprise because they've been coming after every other right of ours slowly creeping in 
to a place where the government has become God, where it's become Savior, where it's become our protection. And we don't even question it. We don't even put up a fight. We didn't even put up a fight. Our churches stopped meeting, didn't even put up a fight. I was, I had that show yesterday where we were talking about the two doctors from uh, the Central Valley of California. And a lot of the pushback that I got from it is, well, the community, does, the majority of doctors say that they're wrong and they don't know what they're talking about. They only had a sample size. They didn't have a whole population. Well, we sure had a lot less data when we closed down all of our industries, our economy. We sure had a lot less data than what they're working off of. But what was the most shocking thing to me, and I don't know why it's shocking, I honestly don't, is that so many people rush to defend the status quo, the authorities, the ivory tower, the people that are in charge, the government, with the dumbest arguments I've ever heard. Oh, they run for-profit clinics. So we should trust the hospitals who get like $30,000 or something per COVID case. Those are the people that are more respectable. Or they, were, they weren't using the full population of the United States. They were using a sample size, which is how you use statistics all the time, right? It's, the, it's a big part of the statistics is understanding when you have an appropriate sample size, not how do you get to the largest population or get to the complete population. It's absolutely insane. But it's just absolutely amazing to me. And I think the reason is, is we've been conditioned, we've been trained to think that the government has it all figured out. And the moment it gets questioned, you're a conspiracy theorist, you're a wacko, you're not living in reality, you don't have the right data, you have false motives, do not question my God. Don't question my Savior. Because then I realize I'm on sinking sand. I'm not on a solid rock. My hope and protection is a fraud. And the moment you let one creek one crack of water flow through that dam, it falls apart and they know it. And that's why whenever you see people push back against the government today, whenever you see people pushing against, pushing back with data, even a university like Stanford, people are livid. People are irrational because they can't doubt it for a second or the facade falls down. And so we've given up our businesses, we've given up our organizations, we've given up our careers, and we have 30 million people unemployed. And we have strip malls completely closed. Because we can't question, because we don't question, because we're too comfortable pretending like the government will do what's right and what's best regardless. It's absolutely insane. It's absolutely insane. All right, let's just talk about the thing that I really wanted to talk about. It's interesting. I was uh, going through my emails, and one of the things that came up, which was interesting, it was actually a median, Medium article. And the, the title of it was, Google's Powerful Secret to Be a Good Manager. And it's just funny because it's not a secret, but it was talking about in 2008, Google undertook a study to answer this question. Google's Project Oxygen was birthed with a fundamental mission to build better bosses. And it basically, I'm just going to you know, tell you the little secret, which is pretty common sense, is that the best managers are coaches. Now, it makes sense to me. I grew up playing sports. I was an athlete. I was a jock. I played everything. I played soccer. I played wrestling. I played football. I played or I swam. I did track. I did hockey. I mean, I can't even remember all the sports that I've done. And I think that is why that I have become a good manager, that I manage teams effectively, is because I grew up being managed. In baseball, they get it. You're a manager. You manage your lineup. You manage your pitchers. You manage the strategy. You manage the prep. You manage the coaching. You manage the innings. You manage the end of the game. You're managing. So I don't, it's not a secret. But this is what I want you to take from this. Is that 
the same way that a good coach coaches a team is the same way that you should be coaching your employees, your direct reports. And I want you to just think about it. And maybe you're a manager now, or maybe you're thinking of becoming a manager, or maybe you're scared to be a manager. You feel like you don't have the skills. And maybe, hey, go coach a sports team. Go coach a men's league. Go go coach a kid's league. And start developing those skills. I guarantee you they transfer. But just imagine, and it's just funny when you put the, you apply some bad managing styles into coaching like a sports team. Like the micromanager, I was thinking that's a pretty funny one. Could you imagine if instead (laughs) the micromanager business leader, the manager, comes, starts coaches a soccer team, doesn't really quite like how his forward dribbles the ball. So he takes him out and puts himself in the game and starts to do and play forward himself, leaving his coaching to nobody, leaving his position basically open. That would be ridiculous. Could you imagine on a professional sports team, a coach, a manager saying, no, you don't know how to hit that ball. Let me do it. And he goes up to the plate and starts swinging or in hockey, he pulls the goalie, puts himself in the goalie. It's absurd. It would never happen. But somehow, in professional corporations, in small businesses, we have managers that do that very thing. That do that very thing. And just like in sports, when the majority of your coaching happens before the game, you are going over expectations of roles. You are tweaking. You're critiquing. You are helping prepare and build up players to be in the position that they're in. So too, as a manager, that is how you build trust and relationships with your employees. You're building them up. You're establishing establishing clear expectations. And then you go let them perform. The majority of what a manager or coach, a manager, baseball manager, a coach on a sports team, a majority of their work is pregame and postgame, not during the game. And so too, with your managing style, the project is not where you should be managing the most. It's a pre-project. It's setting up. It's where you are saying, these are my expectations. Now go do it and perform. And you can coach through the project, say, okay, this is good. Now go back and tweak this, check that out. But when you think of it through a coaching perspective, you start to see what a manager should look like. And they're pretty, pretty much identical with how you should be managing a team. So if you don't have the skills of manager and you want to become a manager, go coach a sports team. Go study coaches. Go listen to coaches. And that's why you see coaches that are motivational speakers that speak in businesses and things like that. Another thing that coaches do that I just want to touch on and then we'll close is that they want to develop players. They're not threatened when their star player plays a great game. They're not threatened when their players that turned out to be or that were expected to be less subpar like gap players, bench players, turns out to be superstars. The coach looks good. When the team performs well, the coach gets the glory. They're the ones who get the accolades because they have coached up the team. The players are playing well. The team is executing. So too in management. And oftentimes managers get threatened in business when they have people that work for them that are super talented, maybe even smarter than them, maybe more talented than them, than them. But they shouldn't. Because they're going to look good. You should be constantly looking to develop and improve your talent. You should be putting them and coaching them into positions that they're going to play to their strengths. Because you're going to look good. You shouldn't be threatened by that. You shouldn't be threatened by that. So think of coaching in the context of sports. Or think of being a manager in the context of sports. Look to get that experience. If you want to become a manager, think of doing it at a sports team. That's a great place to learn with it. It's not going to kill your career. And just think of how you are managing your reports today. And what would that look like if you were doing that on a sports team? And I feel like you would be able to see places for improvement in your management style. Let's go out and be successful. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Bye.